And then I also realized that a lot of my clients, my small clients, had problems from the get-go. Like it didn't matter what I was doing on a profit improvement uh, relationship with them where I was coming in and doing an operational overview and then helping them fix their business. Um, a lot of times their occupancy costs and their investment costs were so excessive that no matter what I did to allow them to achieve or, achieve or uh, attain their optimal operating levels, they were always behind the eight ball because they had been uh, burdened with an economic model that never penciled out. Really? So <clears throat> that is what kind of drove me into the feasibility study side and the lease negotiation side, which was that your money could be better spent on me spending one hour before you ever pull the trigger on a deal like this than me coming in after you've invested hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars uh, in your business that I can't ever salvage. G'day folks, my next guest is the master tactician, Adam Block, probably one of the most important invisible players in the hospitality industry. He's done like 2,000 deals across the United States. Yes, 2,000. He has owned, run, negotiated, reinvigorated, mitigated, leased, litigated so many damn deals my head spinning he manages to stay super humble though he talks partners deals covid and reimagining the hospitality space he gives insights on how to pivot and lean forward in today's playing field and how to navigate the sharks this guy is super informative an old mate of mine of course and i used to use him as a mentor actually in a trusted ear for advice sometimes i'd listen sometimes i wouldn't and he'd probably yell at me but now on with the show the raw hospitality show my good friend adam block hey mate how are you i'm good thanks. welcome how to the you? show thank you so i'm just going through and i didn't realize how many places you've got i mean i always knew but I wrote them down just so I'd remember them. So you got the press lounge, the print restaurant. You are your partners with a very well-known chef. We're going to get to it. Farm shop in Marin County in Santa Monica. You've got Vesuvio Bakery, Vesuvio Bakery, and Block Associates, your consulting business. And you've got a wholesale bakery space, or yes, uh, in Culver City, also farm shop, right? Uh, which uh, Jeff opened probably five years ago, and then when our partnership was formed that became another so piece. So Jeff of, is our mate. Jeff Cerciello. Yep. Yeah, Jeff Cerciello, great, great chef who, who started Farm Shop, right? And you basically got involved with him, how to scale and get the business and pivot it. And Yes, yeah. And Jeff and I have known each other for 20 some odd years. Yep. And I always swore never to be partners with somebody who was a friend. <laughs> and I and that has worked against me over the years. Yeah, so well, I, we're going to get to that. Yeah. that model. But I, I watch you guys. I mean, you introduced me to him. He's super fit. He's a great chef for anybody who doesn't know him from Farm Shop. Um, and you guys have been friends forever and introduced me and him together and i just i don't know every time i'm i'm with him i'm always got a sore liver or something like that so i want to go to start with your career is you started you got a business degree at denver university right in hotel and restaurant manager correct right and you got a trained lawyer as well i'm not you're not but you yeah. work like one i do yeah so what was your first before we get into the tactician side of your life what was like your first dining experience that you actually went hey i want to be involved in this business I would say it's a food moment, right. but uh, when I was uh, 15, right. my mom took me to Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, and back in the mid-70s, this is 1975, you didn't really have a lot of food culture experience uh, in Chicago, which sure. is where I was gro growing up. I mean, you had the local ethnic scene but yep. it wasn't to the extent of what, what, really are we, what are we 77 did you say or 70 1975 1975 shit was gene and georgetti's there then yes i think that was yeah, there. yeah that was kind of the but those area. are those are more chicago yeah um uh, centric type restaurants right. and, and grew up real meat and potatoes yep. um and i think of big nights you ever see the movie big yep. night love that movie so i think of that as the measure, not the true Italian restaurant, yep. but the restaurant that was incredibly successful across the street yep. from Stanley Tucci's restaurant. Yep. And uh, so my first food experience was on this trip. We went, first night we stayed in Tel Aviv, and yep. you, know, you would think your mindset of going to Israel would have been, oh, this is gonna be a Middle Eastern experience. Well, we went to a French restaurant. Right. And, um, and I had never eaten anything like it before. I just, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was 
today just because it's been a long time. Yeah. But I just remember how good it was. And it was one of those light bulb moments. Here I was 15 years old and the light bulb goes on, goes up, goes on in my head, which um, was really about how fantastic a food experience could be. So at what age were you? 15. 15. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so then... And, it, and also keep in mind, the fish we were having in Chicago for the most part was frozen and probably yep. been sitting in a freezer for yep. months before it ever Jesus. made it to my table for sure. And that would be a short time <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things were probably in the freezer longer than that. I just didn't know. Um, and they were typically fried. Yeah, it just You didn't really have fresh ingredients as an option um, to the extent that we do today. And uh, so here, the next part of our trip, we get to um, – Sea of Galilee and Tiberius, yep. and they bring fish out, and uh, it's um, it's inviscerated, uh, head head on, tail on. Yep. And I probably never seen anything like never that, right? seen anything yeah. like it. Yeah. And the fish was it was so simple, clean, pure. It was amazing, and that was just fortified that previous experience I had had, and that's when I started getting interested in food. As a consumer, not as necessarily getting into the hospitality business, but I, I guess uh, it was uh, ingrained in my DNA at that point in time or became ingrained in my But, but yeah, you find this interesting is like that's a really vivid memory. That's, that was really clear. You were basically talking like I can't even remember what I ate yesterday, right? But there are some moments in our lives where you can go back and they talk about this sensory experience. A lot of times when you have restaurants, you have childhood mo memories in there that you know encapsulate an idea of how you run a restaurant. And you were bringing up that movie with Stanley Tucci, if anybody hasn't seen it, called The uh, Big Night. I don't know if it's The Big Night. I think it's The Big Night without a the. And it's basically a successful restaurant on one side. Two Italian boys open a restaurant on the other side. They're in basically mainstream America in the era, which I think in those days it was like 65, 1970s. That's the era they were trying to shoot it in. And the brother of Stanley Tucci is a really re well-regarded chef and really well-known, and people don't get it. And I remember the woman smoking while she's eating and asking where the hell the meatballs are on the spaghetti. And he goes, well, they don't go on spaghetti. They go on the side. And she goes, what kind of restaurant doesn't have meatballs and spaghetti? And that was like, you're basically saying that's where you were in Chicago in the food scene, right? Like it was pretty basic. Yes, yes. And there's also another great scene in the end when he when they make eggs. Do you remember that yes, scene? Yes, yes, absolutely. Can you describe just it? Simp it was just simple. It was a simple yep. moment. It was a simple, it was uh, late at night and they had had this huge fight, yep. I think, that this was the ending of the movie. And uh, again, now I'm <laughs> having to uh, uh, reach back into my memory on this. But I just remember him cooking eggs and how yep. pure that was and how good it looked and yep. how amazing that moment was for the two of them to break bread together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, it's, it's such a great movie. I mean, that's actually how I learned to cook was eggs because we didn't have a lot of money. So I kept using eggs. And I remember my mother yelling at me one day because I made a cake and the recipe had 12 eggs in it. Um, and I'm sure it did, but I, you know, being a dyslexic <laughs> kid, maybe it only said six. And she was horrified. She couldn't understand why the fuck I used 12 eggs in a cake. So now we're in, I'm winding forward a little bit. So like I'm looking at my notes here and it was kind of interesting <clears throat> talking to people that knew you as well. I looked at, um, you started Block Associates in 1987, which was a consulting bu business that started feasibility market analysis, basically the short version of, you know, competition, what the market looks like, price points, you know, risk profile, that kind of stuff, right? Lease negotiations, litigation, strategic planning, and another 50 other, you know, um, um, uh, services in your company. And what made you at 1987 think that was the right way to go? <clears throat> That's a lot of stuff to um, to lay out there to answer all at once. But um, it started off where I had been in – after college, I had been – so that this is 1982. Um, I had gone to school, as you uh, noted, um, and I had worked in college uh, in the restaurant industry, worked in hotels, worked in catering. And so I'd already been in the business by the time I gotten out of school. Yep for uh, six years, mm -hmm. and because uh, I started at 16. And uh, I started looking at where my education and my experience uh, would benefit me most. So I went out and worked in the industry. I worked 
for um, a group that owned a restaurant and a live nightclub up in Aspen. Yeah, wow. And they were independents. And uh, it was a seasonal business. Even though it was year-round, it was really seasonal uh, based on the nature of um, uh, back in those days how Aspen – uh, tourism was driven, which was they had the music festival in the summer. Yep. Um, they hadn't had the food and wine festival yet right, at that right. point in time. And then they had uh, the winter skiing season. Come April, May, June, it was pretty dead. And yep. It was like after kids were out of school, that's when you saw your summer push. And it was a very different audience than yep. what you saw in the ski season. So, Does anybody ski in Aspen? I mean, <clears throat> well, last maybe time not I went anymore, there was a, a years ago, and it then. seemed like more people went there to, to look at each other in their fancy outfits than they actually went skiing. I was, they, look, the That's whole reason I was even me, ended up in Aspen was because I skied. Right. I went to, when I was going to school, I was uh, on the ski team, uh, DU ski team. Yep. So um, for my first couple of years in school and... Uh, when I graduated, I, I just wanted to be close to the slopes where mm -hmm. I could ski 50, 60 days a year wow. before I go to work. I didn't know that about you. I've known you for a long time. I didn't know that you were an avid skier. Do you yeah. still ski now? Mm -hmm, I do. Huh. Yeah. I actually train all year round just so I can ski, if I'm lucky, 10 days a year. Wow. So I'm a big mountain bike rider. Yep. Um, I do Pilates. I do all, you know, at 60 now, I have to yeah, be careful. You don't look 60. That's injury. probably because Thanks. you don't live like me. Thanks. Well, <laughs> <laughs> or Jason, my business uh, partner. You guys look good. Yeah. yeah well. uh, so, um, uh, so anyhow, uh, I went from this independent operation to a multi-unit operator based out of Phoenix, Arizona, right. who I worked with, who had about, I think, 20 units. And they tr first job out of training. When you say 20 units, you mean 20 venues. 20 venues, yep. yeah. Yep. Just for the young people out there that don't know the, uh, the 20, technical yeah. talk. So they put me in Dallas, and yeah. I lived in Dallas for about a year. Doing what? Uh, working in their restaurant as a yeah. manager. Right. And, a, and then they— Did you know uh, what you were doing? I did. You I, did? Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, at that point in time, I'd been in the business uh, for— um, let's see, this is 84, so I'd been in the business for eight years at that point. Right. What are you, 25? I was 24. 24. Mm -hmm. And you're a restaurant manager already. Yeah, I had actually been a, I, my first job was a catering ser, ser, service supervisor right. with Marriott. That was in Denver. I was 20. Yeah, it's crazy. And isn't then it? when I was in Aspen, I was a general manager of both the operations, yep. the restaurant and the nightclub. And uh, I didn't really know what I was doing then. Yeah. <laughs> I could say that. But by the time I ended up working with this group out of uh, Phoenix, I did know what I was doing. Yep. I was actually pretty seasoned for a lot of managers um, that were older than me just because I had had a number of years. And especially working with independents, you get to see a lot of things that would you would not normally get involved in because it's just not as structured and organized. So someone right. in a, uh, a management position was probably responsible uh, for everything at some point in time. So you're a restaurant manager. You're 25 years old. 24 at this point. 24 yeah. years old. I keep giving you an extra yeah. year. And what actually were you doing? How big was the restaurant? Uh, so the restaurant was probably uh, 80 employees, oh, okay. uh, dinner only. 50% um, of it was a um, nightclub, and the other 50% was a uh, surf and turf type operation. Yep. And um, so from that operation, I ended up getting transferred to open up another one of their units in Northern California. Right. That's how I ended up in Northern California. So did you learn, I mean, and obviously a place that big, most people probably were older than you. Yes. And yeah. so how did you deal with that? Because I remember when I was prom over promoted very young, and I've said that on the show a few times where, you know, I was put into, I remember when I got my first computer and an assistant, and I was like 24. 5, 26, and I didn't know what to do with either of them. I didn't even know what to do to computer. And I wonder, you got thrown in the deep end. You would have got ribbed a little bit from the older crew thinking, well, you're a young guy. What do you know? I've been doing this for 50 years, blah, blah, blah. How did you deal with that? Uh, you know, I, I liken myself to a terrier against a Great Dane. No idea of my size <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I was um, uh, very confident about what I knew, even yep. if I didn't know, even yep. if I was the unconscious and confident. Yeah, yeah, is, sure. Um, but um, but it, I think that confidence carried me through uh, to getting more responsibility. And, um, at, and then at the ripe age of 26, I came to this crossroad, which now I've been in the business for 10 years, yep. 
was do I stay in this industry because I didn't want to own a restaurant. I didn't want to operate a restaurant. Why? How did you know you didn't want to do that? Because I had had 10 years under my belt. I found it pretty unrewarding. I saw what was above me and the multi-unit operations. (laughs) I saw the hand to mouth in the independent operations. And I just thought I would not find enjoyment in that. And so I actually interviewed with the, and I wish I could remember his name, the owner of Crate and Barrel, because they were based in... um, they were based in uh, the North Shore of, Chi- of sh- the Chicago area, sure. which I grew up in. I, as right. I mentioned, I grew up in Chicago. I actually grew up in a town called Highland Park, which mm-hmm. is on the North Shore. <clears throat> and um, my dad was in the furniture business. So he knew the um, founder of Crate and Barrel yep. very well. And he said, well, why don't you talk to him, see what he has to say. So I met with him <clears throat> at one of his operations. And uh, he said, look, I'll hire you in a second because anybody who's come out of the restaurant industry, they in retail, um, they would they would um, be an all star because the work ethic in the restaurant industry and the hours you put in yeah. are so significantly more than typical freestanding retail stores or retail stores in but general. Do you think that's also because I was talking to somebody the other day in an interview about relationship breakups in hospitality, how tough they are. And you're one of the rare cases you've been married for quite some time and an amazing wife. Still don't know why she loves you, but I'm <clears> figuring <throat> it out. <laughs> but, you know, do you think, um, um, I brought up the fact that we're problem solvers, right? So what happens in a restaurant, there's always so many moving parts and issues and you've got to think on your feet. So when you go into a different organization, they love that part of us where we're a little bit more agile to go, okay, that's an issue that, you know, the door broke or there's something along with the alarm. And do you think that benefits you outside the hospitality industry and did it? Uh, I, I feel like, you know, the a restaurateur, a successful one, yep. only sees problems. Yeah. <laughs> and I, honest to God, I walk in. Yeah, that's why we're always to, so stressed. Yeah, I walk into my, exactly. Yeah. I walk into my restaurant, all I can see is what's wrong. Yeah. Now it's what, not uh, what's right. And yeah. I, you, you could call me a malcontent, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah I just, no. I, I am searching for perfection. Sure. And so when I see something wrong, I imagine uh, what someone else would see, a sure. customer. If What would they think if they saw um, something out of place or something that uh, looked like we were cutting corners? Right. And, um, and there are some that would pick that up, but it's more the subliminal message of somebody seeing it, not knowing what it is, but it doesn't give them a good feeling. Right. You know, it's that, that uh, sub- subconscious uh, experience you're having. You walk into a place and you're like, ah, the place feels weird. But if, wanna... but the thing is with you is the only time I actually have ever seen you relaxed in your own venue was when we were shut and it was you and Jason and I sitting on your rooftop during COVID lockdown and we just decided to watch the 4th of July and go, what the hell, right? Because I remember Danny Meyer saying you know, once that he can't, his wife refuses to eat with him in the restaurant because he's working once he's in the restaurant. And I used to find that with us, right? Like you'd walk in and I'd look at the team or if I was back in Australia and I'd go, why is there a light bulb out 100 feet from me on the left-hand side? And they're like, damn it, how did we not see that? Right. And you, and so all of a sudden, you know, people forget that. they. I, I always am very, very uh, jealous of people that can have a restaurant, particularly my business partner, Jason, and he can, soup, he can relax and he can just have a good time, whereas I'll just see, does that have enough lemon on it? Did they give me the right napkin? Did they cheese this? Why is that person doing that? How come no one's attending to that person? Do you feel like that when you're in the restaurant? I don't totally do. Um, yeah. I'm better when I'm not in my own restaurant, but yeah. you're with regards to my wife eating in our restaurants, yeah. she has a very difficult time because yeah. I can't sit still and I do get pulled away from the table. It's not fair to her. It's just I can't help myself. And when you're at somebody else's <laughs> that place, that sounds like an Of excuse. course not. No, but it's yeah. not because it's about aiming for perfection. And we know 99% of the time we don't get there, but it's a lot closer to aim for it. I mean, you, you know, we were talking about this, uh, about the idea of how you could count how many perfect services you had on two hands in your entire career, right? Because you can sit there and you go, well, that was great, but it was like my Australian comedian friend, uh, Mick Malloy, is well known in Australia, and he said to me, he can stand up and do a stand up in front of 4,000 people and everybody's laughing and he's focused on that one dude just, just not laughing, right? That's kind of like a restaurant. You don't see the great night. You just have that one customer that complained about something and it throws you. 
Do you still feel like that now? Yeah. And in fact, I tell my managers, I always talk about the 4% solution, which was something I can't remember along the way I had learned in one of the businesses I worked in early on. And it did resonate with me, yeah. which was that if you had a restaurant doing 200 covers in a night and you had only 4% of your guests have a poor experience, that would only be eight people, right? Doesn't sure. sound like a lot. Not. But if you think in terms, and in, in today with social media and user generated uh, review sites, sure. you see how this works, which is you only get the haters and the doters yeah. in those sites for the most part. Yeah. Uh, and so when somebody has a bad experience, they will tell 10 people. Yeah. So eight people really is 80 people. Yeah. And when somebody has a good experience, it might come up in conversation if someone says they're going to that restaurant or they're thinking sure. about a place to go and, they're, and they'll, they'll confirm, oh, that's a great restaurant I went there. Or I had right, a, oh, right. try this when you're there. But with a bad experience, people will go out of their way to bring it up in conversation. Sure. So they're out reverse marketing you. So if you think in terms of now 80 people and then there's – another layer to that of people saying, oh, I heard somebody had a bad experience there. Yeah, I mean, you come from an era like I do where um, a lot of the younger generation now, the millennials get a hard time, but I actually think we gave them a lot of the stuff that they get a hard time about. But most of the restaurant teams that I have are young, and if some of them are my age, they'll remember this, but we, we used to deal with people hand and foot on the premise if they're unhappy. Now, somebody can you know, write a message or post online and it's not even legitimate and they can exploit your business in that way. Sometimes it's fair, sometimes it's not fair, and we all hate it. No one wants to have constant reviews online. I don't think anybody I know in restaurants thinks that's a good idea. But I want to understand, so before we go into your new your businesses that you have concurrently, so 87 you opened Block Associates? So, yeah, so 87, I so I was started to talk about the f fact that at the ripe age of 26, I decided I did not want to – owner operate a business yeah and a uh, restaurant business yeah. I'm sorry uh, and but I also after meeting with um, the owner of Crate and Barrel I also said I don't think I want to give up my education yeah. and everything I've done for the last 10 years so what's my other option and naively thought well I don't have any gray hair but I should try a take a shot at consulting you know right. and um, but who's gonna believe me you yeah. know and and this goes back to the confidence side. Well, I believed in myself. I also overcompensated for areas that I felt I wasn't strong in. And Ow. I think that, well, I, I would, when there was an area that I was consulting in, yeah. I would go so deep and get so granular uh, that I felt, you know, I was not going to leave anything on the table, that right. I was going to have so the, 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 the So the key services being something that you were providing with, you weren't as sure about it as everything else. So you basically made sure that every corner was dusted and everything was perfect and basically over-serviced <clears throat> them in a way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it, to, to that point, later in my career, I, and I'm talking about 20 years later after I started my consulting business, I was going through, I kept every single file I had had Jesus. from the beginning. And I did what would be called in the consulting universe or accounting or even uh, legal, a peer review. And I did a peer review on my original files. Wow. So I went back and just randomly picked files out of different banker boxes. You know, this is before we stored everything on hard drives sure, yeah, yeah. Um, or clouded it. And I went through um, and picked a few, some that I didn't even know, remember. I had done so many, I worked on so many um, engagements that there were some I couldn't even remember the name of the engagement. Wow. So I'd pull it out of a but box. You, I, I'm, am I right to say you've done nearly 1,200 deals or more? I think it's more. <laughs> I, I, if I said how much I really think, it would sound incredulous. So yeah, I, I mean, this isn't crapshoot. This is like a deal could take six months. It's 12 months or longer, right? Well, early on, I worked on a lot of small clients, independent yeah. clients. And what I was doing was um, I would run as many as uh, 100 clients a year. Yeah, wow. This is sometimes more. and But they'd be everything from business planning to concept design, lease negotiations, as you mentioned, site selection. But what I had found over time was 100 that- 100 a year? Just to just put that in perspective. So I can barely manage all my emails. How do you manage 100 people 
in a year. Well, back in those days, I would actually drive because most of my practice was in the Bay Area. So right. I'd drive out to uh, up to Napa. I'd drive up to Humboldt County. I would yep. drive down to San Jose, um, occasionally have a job down in L.A. But I didn't really do much outside of the state of uh, California. Right. And I had realized that... Uh, you know, back in those days, by the way, there were these micro business climates. So what was going on in California and New York wasn't necessarily how the business climate was in, say, Denver and Houston. Yeah, sure. You know, and we as a country didn't move as an economy. Yeah. We moved regionally. Yeah. And um, so I had kind of concluded early on, I need to get outside of California yep. to help uh, protect my business, to mitigate the risk of things going south in California and not having work outside the state, I need to be in another economy. Makes sense. <clears throat> so I started uh, with that. And then I also realized that a lot of my clients, my small clients, had problems from the get-go. Like it didn't matter what I was doing on a profit improvement uh, relationship with them where I was coming in and doing an operational overview and then helping them fix their business. Um, a lot of times their occupancy costs and their investment costs were so excessive that no matter what I did to allow them to achieve or achieve or uh, attain their optimal operating levels, they were always behind the eight ball because they had been uh, burdened with an economic model that never penciled out. Really? So <clears throat> that is what kind of drove me into the feasibility study side and the lease negotiation side, which was that your money could be better spent on me spending one hour before you ever pull the trigger on a deal like this than me coming in after you've invested hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars uh, in your business that I can't ever salvage even. But you're, you're basically saying, and I don't think much has actually changed, is that you get somebody that's incredibly passionate about something. So let's use the restaurant model. And so here I am. I'm a partner with someone, she's a sommelier, I'm a chef, or the other way around, and we both go, let's go open a restaurant. You, you're a really great cook, and you're very good with wine, and we know how to run some stuff. But then, you know, all of a sudden, overnight, these these generally we were all kids when we were doing it, we have to become accountants, financiers, uh, you know, good at bookkeeping, understand law, litigation, fire, safety, insurance, and a whole bunch of stuff. And really that's, for people listening, is essentially what your business became right it became a place where you got an individual that wanted to open something or individuals that wanted to open something and you provided services that they necessarily didn't understand or weren't good at or needed help on yes um, right. but what my what I felt my best service would be was to protect them against their themselves uh, <laughs> themselves right <laughs> yeah. and I, I mentioned I had made the reference to the unconscious incompetent I yeah. always said there are two categories of my clients, or there's one categories of, of my clients, but there's two categories that would approach me. Uh, one would be the unconscious incompetent, which was- What do you mean by that? They didn't know what they didn't know. Yeah. And then there was the conscious incompetent, which mm -hmm. was they did know what they didn't know, and that's why they hired me. That one was the one that was going to listen to me. You explain that so better, so so much better than Donald Rumsfeld with the unknown of the unknown. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that makes sense, right? So it's what the things they don't know, and they're getting into themselves into trouble. And restaurants are inevitably not very profitable. They're very difficult businesses. They're not the only difficult business. So I don't like to be the martyr of restaurants. But even to this day, we still meet people that have never opened a restaurant. Don't you know have anything more than a chef. And then they think they're off and running that the food will just make itself way there. With this many people that you've dealt with, are you a deal junkie? Because you kind of, I feel like you and I were for a period of time. Or I, I mean, we tried to do a few things together and flirted with the idea. Did you become a bit of a deal junkie? Well, I was a deal junkie. I loved closing the deal. Yeah. Um, and I loved, um, I loved watching my business grow to the extent that it did. You know, right. I, I, as we started talking about, I worked with the independent operator. Mm -hmm. I started working <clears throat> then with, um, um, I started working with multi-unit operators who had bigger yeah. budgets. Yeah. The independent really needed my help the most, but yeah. the, the multi-unit operator was the one that had the budget that could support me. Um, so I had to have a balance between kind of like law firms often have pro bono sure, clients. Sure. Some of those uh, smaller independents were kind of that to me. And uh, <clears throat> I really wanted to help them. Uh, but then it kind of snowballed. Then I ended up getting a 
landing a contract uh, where I was brought in by a primary um, contractor for a uh, government job, which I had never uh, been involved in. And it was a what they called a uh, indefinite quantities contract uh, that was an RFP. I don't even know what you just said. Then. It was multiple. Quant they never had told us what the job was, but the job was uh, had multi contracts in any given year based on the OMB yeah. providing this, the the U.S. Uh, Treasury providing an allocation to the Department of Interior and then in the, under the uh, Department of Interior was the National Park Service and that's who hired me. To we, do what? To look at their concessions. So they had a very old antiquated format for determining uh, how to select concessionaires and they realized it, this is 1990 when um do you mean do you mean so i want to understand this so the government came to you your block associates a hospitality venue right essentially a, a consultancy they're asking you to provide them with analytics and data on what so the government didn't come to me they yeah. there was a primary by the name of gotcha. david dornbush and i kind of everyone wants a mentor and i haven't yep. talked to david in many many years and so he'd probably laugh if he heard this but he was my mentor he had right. shown me who was he David was did a lot of Indian rights and water rights right. consulting, and he right. didn't have a lot of experience in uh, the food and beverage hospitality side. And this contract comes along, and he knew he was um, uh, 20 years older than me, uh, and Harvard gra business uh, yep. grad, and um, very smart, but very approachable human being. Very, what are you just, now, about 30? I was 30, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, and anyhow, David had tremendous experience in dealing with government contracts, which is a real specialty. Sure. I had zero experience. So he asked me if I'd be part of the team that was pitching this uh, RFP, mm -hmm. this request for proposal. Yep. And uh, he wanted to layer it in. And uh, so they we won it. And it was a small business contract. So it went right. out to... Um, it didn't want to, they didn't want to go after large, at that time, uh, I think it was the big eight accounting firms, yep. uh, which aren't big eight anymore. I think it's big two. Yep. <laughs> I don't think there's many left. Um, the days of Arthur Anderson, I think. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and the Laventhal and Horwass and the yep. um, uh, um, half hour PKS, radio station, know what yep. we're talking about. So, They're like, who? So they, uh, so we won. He won the contract, and I was part of it. So I really kind of coattailed into it. And with that, um, they then give us each year. It was a five-year contract, which turned into a ten-year contract. Uh, and the, they would give us each year these various parks. Sure. And they'd have concessions in it that they would want us to analyze. Mm -hmm. And it could be a feasibility study. It could be a new uh, negotiation of the franchise fees, which is equivalent to rent. Um, but it was really triggered when Manuel Lujan was the Secretary of the Interior working under Bush. Yep. And they had Machutsta, Machutsta, am I pronouncing that correctly, uh, acquired Curry Company. And Curry had the largest concession in the National Park Service in uh, Yosemite. It was doing right. $90 and a half million dollars a year. Wow. And they felt it, it had to be an American company that was going to own and operate. So they wanted to put out a new contract. And to do that, they really needed to set up, set some precedent for how the terms of this selection process would go. So they started this, they put this contract out there and we kind of, we, we uh, cut our teeth on these smaller contracts. Uh, I'd say there was probably 10 or 20 we did before we got to the Yosemite one. Wow, that's yeah. a that's a that's a pretty big deal and very complex for a thirty year old, right? It was especially dealing with government <clears throat> as well, which is they're usually sloppy, lazy, overspend, and a bureaucratic. Right, at best. and and you know I talked about overcompensating. I didn't even know where to begin there, and yeah. that's where David came in, and David had shown me ways to analyze things that I then later used as my own model for my own business model for how so, I analyzed so all my- So we're gonna go there. So you had brain trauma from obviously dealing with the government. What was the first, because there's no one ever says to me at 25 they decided they didn't want to be in restaurants because it wasn't objective, it didn't look like it was worthwhile. We usually say that when we're around 50. Yeah, but, but you, you would say it after being in the business for 10 years. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so, so now you've got a bit of brain trauma from doing yeah. all these deals. 
what was the first business that you decided you woke up and you went, I'm going to go and open my own, you know, gig. And we're going to get to relationships and partners after this. Well, remember, the consulting business was that. I mean, Block mm -hmm. & Associates was uh, just that. It was my first business. It was pretty lean and mean. Um, have computer, will travel. Yeah. And well, What did... was your first tangible biz restaurant or bar or partnership? So that was with uh, Thomas Keller. Yep. Um, he and I... Um, so there was a project we were doing in... Um, Vegas. I did a lot of work in Vegas. I yep. didn't get into the whole celebrity chef piece of it. But yep. in the early sure, 90s, sure. around the time that I was working on these uh, park service contracts, I got a call from a guy by the name of Charlie Trotter. Yep. Um, who was passed away now uh, almost 10 years ago. November, uh, it's coming up to uh, the seventh anniversary very yep. shortly. I think it was yep. November 5th and um, in 2013. Yep. Famous he, Chicago chef. Right. You know, um, actually probably one of the first thinkers of plant forward eating um, and generally you know like he was breaking new ground I think I was a baby watching his books I think there was a book called the kitchen sessions and correct I'd been to his restaurant and he was doing stuff that he was making ravioli out of vegetables and he was doing all kinds of stuff that probably 15 20 years ago was unheard of now it's kind of common oh it probably uh, we're talking more like almost 30 years ago right because when he – so the way Charlie came to me was that his father was his business advisor. Yeah. And his father passed away. And um, in 1993, he was uh, approached by uh, the MGM Grand. And the reason was that um, – Kerry Packard had come in. Yeah, the Australian mogul billionaire. Correct. And yeah. he beat the house big, yeah. as the story goes. Yeah. And he left and he went to go eat at um, Caesars and apparently yeah. lost some of the money that he had beaten MGM yeah. on at Caesars. Yeah. And he was what they call a whale, right? Yeah. So they flew him in. And the story, and I don't know, I've never gotten this verified, it's been told to me, that he signed over the gas check for his, uh, <laughs> for his airplane yeah. to a cocktail server at um, Caesars. Yeah. That's a story I can't verify. Yeah, there's a few was... whale stories from him buying a golf club, a go sorry, golf course in Australia that wouldn't let him be a member, so he bought it and then fired everyone. There's all that kind of stuff. So he comes back to the MGM and they said, what do we have to do to keep you from ever leaving the property again when we fly you in here from Australia? Yeah. And he said, get a decent restaurant in there. So they went out and looked for who was the best restaurateur that was going to be um, – someone that was engaging enough to keep someone like Kerry Backer in the Don't hotel. you find that interesting, though? Because Charlie Trotter's palate. This palette, is 1993, by the right. way. Right. And, and I looked after Kerry Packer before he passed many years in my restaurant. You know what he used to eat? He used to have a blue steak, fries, and Coke. Okay. So then and this, he had the this, worst palate in the world. He this was will like tie a, into the story. He was a Burger King Fanta guy, right? So I found that yeah. ironic. So so here's fast forward the yep. story, uh, or go back. Uh, he... Um, so they know he's coming back in December. So this was December of 92. They yep. know he's coming back in December of 93. I get a call from Charlie Trotter in July of 1993. And he tells me um, he got my name from a guy by the name of Jordan Moser, who yep. was an architect, well-known architect, who I happened to go to high school with in Highland Park. Yep. Yep. became a very famous architect. And he knew Charlie really well. And he recommended me to Charlie. So uh, Charlie, I, I fly out to meet with Charlie in Chicago, and the story is they, they, he's been selected, one of 10 chefs, I think, at that time, uh, who they were interested in bringing in to get this restaurant built before yep. Kerry Packer comes back in December. So this is July, half a year to do this. In. Yep. So they, uh, end up, um, uh, they end up talking to uh, Jabir Lacoste, mm -hmm. um, who is for the audience? Uh, uh, he was uh, Le Bernardin. He, yep. he and Maggie Lacoste at yep. Le Bernardin. Eric Repair at that point in time wasn't. Yep. He was, I think, a sous chef there. Yep. And um, anyhow, they were also talking to um, Andre Saltner yep. from Lutes. They were talking to everybody. So for the audience, the young audience, don't know, they're very well known. And, uh, very, very well known. Well, well regarded European chefs. chefs. Yep. And they choose Charlie, and he's the youngest of them all. And, uh, and he had Trotters open then, right? He Trotter, yeah, Trotters, he had Trotters on Trotters Armitage. Open. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So I end up um, uh, negotiating a deal. I had no idea what I was doing. I picked the numbers from the air. Yeah. And I came up with a 
five percent man uh, five percent management fee, fifteen percent subordinated incentive fee, which is profit sharing, yep. and a buyout and a pre development fee. Yep. And um, little did I know, most of that became the template for licensing. Yeah. In Isn't that interesting that you knew how Las to put Vegas. a deal? Well, you kind of didn't know you were putting your thumb in the wind, but you actually ended up putting a base deal together that made sense. Right. And I was so pleased with Not much has changed from those kind of deals. What, what's that? Not much has changed these days no. from those kind of no, deals. No, but and, and, and it was really interesting because there was nothing like that going on in Vegas. So at they that say time. yes? So they cut the deal. And I was so proud of myself, so elated. Yep. And I remember I was really floating after I did that deal and I got it done and it was huge. And I was dealing with uh, Lou Silvestri at that time was uh, negotiating for MGM, yep. who was a fixture in Vegas for a long time. And uh, I was just so happy that I you know, could pull this off. And I was 33. Yep. And I remember telling Charlie, I'm like, so you must be feeling really good about this. And just deadpan looks at me and he goes, eh, I, I kind of look at myself like Reggie Jackson. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, eh, well, he kind of opened up the door for chefs to be making, or for baseball players to be making a million dollars. He was the first baseball player to yep. make a yep. million dollars a year yep. salary. And I looked at him, I'm like, what an asshole. You're, you're no fucking <laughs> Reggie Jackson. No, yeah. I'm not talking about the his but, he right. yeah. but he was but he right. But he was right. But he was right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, at that time, you would have just thought he was an arrogant dick. I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I did in that moment. Yeah. And yeah, so from, but from Charlie, it really kind of opened up my door in working with uh, celebrity chefs. And so from that, I was introduced uh, through Alain Ducasse to Jean-Louis Paladin. Jean-Louis right. became a client. I worked with Jean-Louis for years. Jean-Louis introduced me to then Gray Coons and... Um, All the great, great names. Thomas Keller. Yep. Yes. And so so tell, before we go to Keller, I want to talk about the deal you did with him. Tell us about what happened with P Packer when he came back. So Kerry Packer, the billionaire mogul, and in so those we get days, it up. So we get the because <laughs> in those days in Australia, a billionaire was like a trillionaire now. Like yeah. that was a big amount of money. So so Charlie goes all out, brings in like Bonet Suites. You know yep. that was before more Maltini came, mm -hmm. uh, but he went. I mean, all out. Biedermeier design. Yeah. I mean, it was like ridiculous. He they, made the casinos. They, they triple checks. shifted. This is Union building this yep. triple shifted twenty four hour shifts building this restaurant out so it would be done and ready by the time Kerry Packer came in. Kerry comes in, I think he had an appetizer, maybe, maybe, yep. maybe and he one said, what other the fuck thing is this? <laughs> left. Yep, At no interest. And they asked yep. him like, we, you know, what did you think? And he was like, I, I don't have time for a meal like this. You know, yeah, he did, it took him away from the tables. Yeah, I mean, he was like that in the restaurant. It was horrible. Uh, you know, he would eat. He would eat literally a steak blue, and and we would have a beautiful seaside restaurant. And he would eat a blue steak. He want fries with extra salt, and he would drink Coca Cola. And he would get aggressive about the fact that he didn't have fan. I can't say he was a pleasant person. I think sometimes with people when they pass, everybody wants to glorify them. But uh, you know, I, I found that pretty funny that he was the reason why Charlie Trotter got his first deal. Those two couldn't have eaten any polar opposites, right? He's one of the best chefs in the country cooking very forward-thinking food that's even relevant now. I mean, I've still got his books. And and then you've got a, a, a whale mogul, and his own real essence is just he makes money, right. but has no clue about food and beverage at all. Right. And and all of a sudden, so now we're segueing. And, and by the way, fast forward 20 years later, let me think, 93, 2000, and uh, uh, what was it? I guess it was 2003, so 10 years later. Um, we're traveling to um, Bora Bora, Charlie yep. and myself, yep. and Kerry dies. Yep. We're on the plane together, doing. An, we're looking to do another deal in Tahiti at this time, and Charlie walks up and he drops this newspaper on me. We're on this flight, um, and I look at it, and I was like, it, it was just it's so... It's such a weird... It's how we came together. Yeah, it's but so... It you also, couldn't make this shit up, right? <clears throat> You're the weirdest, the weirdest marriage. And then you, you worked with Keller as well. Was that on the Time Warner, uh, Time yeah, Warner so building well, in New York? Yeah, <clears throat> so Thomas... And I met in 2000. I yep. worked with Thomas for about uh, five and a half years. Yep. Uh, and we, um, so I worked with him. I did the Time Warner deal. Yep. And in that deal, I uh, ended up working with Masa Takayama, bringing Grey Coons the in there. So you helped and Masa Charlie, get in there? And Charlie was supposed to go in right, there. Right, right. Um, and, and that's his stage. You and Charlie were good buddies, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 And we, as I mentioned, we were working on some other things at that point in time. And, um, uh, so when we did that deal, uh, and this is now 2001, yep. when K 
Ken Himmel and Steve Ross came to us uh, about that project. I had already looked at that project and passed on it uh, when it was um, Millennium Partners that was originally developing that project. And then um, they, I guess, didn't fulfill their obligation or something. I can't remember what was the reason it went back out to market. And then Ken and Steve took it. And they really wanted to create a um, a uh, prestige collection of uh, celebrities. And that was shows. like a, a, a changing pivotal moment in the New York dining scene, right? That was the first time, because New York's got such beautiful architecture and a little bit like Australia, uh, it's very seldom a high-end restaurant is in a mall. In a mall. <laughs> in you a mall. Use a mall. Yeah. Uh, mall. And, and, and actually, both of us know Singapore. I worked in Singapore and Singapore's used to it because it's such a new country. Right. Right. And so well, now everything every, because of the heat in Singapore, right. everything and I, has to be interior. And it, it always bugged me. I was always like, I could never understand how you could spend that much money on dinner and ride an escalator to it. Right, and it always bugged. I could never get my head around. And half it. of it's underground. Like half half, it's half underground. the walls are underground in yeah. Singapore. So, so now you've done this deal there. You've had some, you've had some good partnerships like you have now with Jeff Farm Shop. You've had some average ones, right? And we don't have to get into the weeds about. It. I won't review about that. We'll do that over beers one night. But I want to ask you for the younger people out there that haven't got our experience because both of us had you know you always have inflicted trauma on good partners and bad um what would you give it advice to a young person say i'm 25 and you know i'm i'm a chef or i'm a restaurant person and i need money from someone and then someone you know restaurants inevitably are like film sets everybody wants to get in on the action but not really the work right so they want to co-produce everything what would you give as advice to a 25 year old looking at partners and what to look for because there's so much body language the way they behave you know going over our relationships now if i was 25 and you had to give me advice what do i need to look for in a partner other than the fact that they've got money well, if you don't want to have partnership problems, the best solution is don't have partners. How do you do that when you haven't got any money? You mean you have to bring some people in, right? Investors. Yeah. And the problem is, is that when you're 25 years old, yeah, you really have the confidence of somebody who has the discretionary income, sure, disposable income, to invest into a highly risky business. And let's sure. just, you know, we talk economics you know, which we haven't gotten into the real numbers, but if you just take a simple restaurant doing um, uh, a 5,000 square foot restaurant in New York City that's vanilla shell, that yep. doesn't, regardless of if it has TIs or not, the total bill out will probably be for a fine dining restaurant, no less than $1,000 a square foot. Yep. And it could be up words from there. It could be 2000 a square foot. Sure. You can go crazy in, yeah. in sp on how you want to spend. And a lot of the money goes into infrastructure, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural. So if I was 25 and I, okay, we could change the age to 35, but people are putting money behind 25 year olds. I should come up with a plan where everybody either works with me, for me, but no partners and invest and an investor board, right? So you're saying that in best case scenario, you're better off not having working partners. If you can help my, it. In my opinion, from my experience yeah. of being now in this I, business I, I for 40, 42, 42, 42 yeah. years of you know yeah. being beaten up for making decisions that I didn't listen to the little voice in my head yeah. that said, "Don't do this." And and I I was gonna you know finishing the thought of look, you could spend a thousand dollars a square foot on a five million dollar build out yeah. on a five thousand square foot restaurant would it be a five million dollar build out hard and soft costs, uh, and you could do a thousand dollars a square foot. Yep. which would be $5 million a year. Yep. So in a full-service restaurant that's doing 75% food and 25% beverage, you know, you'll be looking at maybe a 7% margin. I mean, crazy if you got to 10, yep. but more like a 7% margin. And that's pretty nutty, right? Because the problem is the percentage of profit in restaurants is so close to zero. Your, your opportunity costs there are not great, and your ability to try and make a lot of money isn't great. And your risk is, you know, huge, right? Because, I mean, not too many financiers that you could put a balance sheet together and say, well, you know, best case scenario, you make 10%, maybe on a billion dollar transaction, that's attractive, but not on a restaurant where, you know, some of these fine dining restaurants, eight to $10 million at best to, for the fit out. And then before you know it, the investors have got a 10 year payback. That's if the restaurant stays open for that long, right? If, if you know, if you're lucky. And, and so here, you know, as I look at it, um, this model of this $5 million restaurant by this example, 
if you're hitting 7% on $5 million in revenues doing $1,000 a square foot, you're looking at $350,000. Yeah. And if you're looking at a three to four year payback, you're talking about an investment that can't be higher than a million two. Yeah. And, and, this, if, and this, this, this city is probably outside even Hong Kong, are probably one of the most expensive cities in the world to run a restaurant. Yeah, San Francisco is very expensive yeah. too. But at a million two, that would mean that you'd have to get your landlord on a $5 million build out to give you $3.8 million in tenant improvement allowances or value engineer that concept down to something that is far more palatable, which sure. you know a lot of times chefs have a vision and operators as well uh, about what they... Uh, they need it to be, and they are unwilling to compromise. But this goes back to that economic model. Unless I can get free rent from yep. a landlord and significant tenant improvement allowances, that $5 million model doesn't work with a $5 million uh, investment. Right, but you like, I want to slightly contradict both because I'm not speaking for myself yet, but we both are aligned with this idea. You fast forward now actually have all the opposite things you actually have a fantastic relationship with a chef from farm shop which you have in marin county and santa monica and i know jeff really well and he's a great chef and usually great chefs can't add and great chefs that can add can't cook and you've got it both in one guy and he's very loyal and you've been friends for a long time and that's working out really well you've also got the press lounge and um and the print restaurant and i wanted to talk about because you i i recently acquired a, a tavern and you were yelling at me for not to not to do it and this was i think it was during Wait, you closed the deal. No, no no yeah i've closed the deal by the way <laughs> this will come out next year so hopefully it'll be open by then but wait by by, by the way the, just yep. to anybody's listening yeah i always tell my clients i know how i can save you tens of thousands of dollars right now yeah and they, their response is always, well, tell me. I yeah, want to go to fucking restaurants. If you don't think you're going to listen to me, <laughs> yeah, don't hire me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't. That's I actually got, had beers with you. <laughs> I'm not saying but, that. No, but that mean. does happen, you know, yeah, where yeah. people will ask me for my input. And it's like, yeah, you're just one opinion. I'm like, yeah, I'm one opinion. But people, people pay me for my mistakes. They don't care about my success. Sure, sure. Yeah, they yeah. want to know what not to do. But see, like you... You've, I, I know you've got a good heart and I know you're very passionate about this industry. And even though you're very academic and strategic about finances and, you know, how to, how to make a restaurant work, just on the vis saying on that, you know, Vesuvio Bakery, a famous bakery, you reimagined that bakery, didn't let it fall over. It's in, uh, it's in Soho Spring Street. It's on uh, Prince between Prince, sorry. Uh, West Broadway and Thompson. Right. This bakery's got 100-year-old 100, 100 ovens downstairs, and you opened it. I went to your, your sort of friends and family, and you opened it seven days before lockdown of COVID, right? Yes. So, and it's back open again, thank God, and beautiful, like really. Thank you. Look. This thing isn't going to buy you a jet, and it ain't going to put you, in, you know, anybody through college. But you still did it, and you still recreated a beautiful, beautiful bakery. That it, it will, knowing you, it'll make money. I've no doubt about that. But tell me how, you know, what was your emotional attachment to that? Sure, you've got a you, your economic side, but your emotional attachment there because it's a, it's a historic place. There's even a park named after the owner, right? Correct. The, uh, Anthony Dopolito, uh, yep. the Dopolitos who started that 100 years ago, the year he was born, 100 years this year. Wow. And uh, so but he was a real, uh, he was a real um, a contributor to this city. Yep. And I think of, you know, you talk about food experiences. I think of one of my very first New York experiences was walking by Vesuvio on a cold day and the windows were all fogged up and I could see through there, you know, it was What just, were they baking? So if I'm in Melbourne, I've never been there before. What were they doing in there? In he the was bakery? doing Italian breads. Yep. I mean, he was, you know, he died, Anthony died in 2003. Right. And yeah, I just felt like it got run into the ground. Yep. You know, I felt like the previous operator just ran it into the ground. Yeah. And it was so sad to me. Yeah. And, um, it was, it's, it's like that soft heart coming out that nostalgic side. You know, you. look, if it was a $5 million investment, no, I don't have that soft of a heart, Yeah, but, um, but it's a little 200 square foot space, retail yeah. space. But look at the, look at the, look at the, 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 the complete difference between 
Press Lounge, which is one of the most spectacular rooftop bars in New York, and it's never going to be built out and can crazy views and great restaurant below to this tiny little bakery that you've basically reimagined and you're not reimagined, probably given it its 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 worthy shot in the arm and renovated it and refurbished it and beautiful product. And I mean, you've brought everything back to life there. I mean, that's an emotional. You can't say that's not emotional because every decision is, but that's that's like a big thing for you because I know how important economics are to making sure things work. And you've given that the city back an institution, right? You know, I'd like to think I have. Yeah, um, I'm trying to give I, you a I, soft spot. Yeah, I could tell you what I love. And I think it's, it's surprising to a lot of people. I will stand outside or I'll go behind the counter and I get to talk to the customers. You know, it's just so it's different from everything else sure. I've done. But I really enjoy it, and I really enjoy which is you know remember the hospitality business uh, you have to be hospitable, and sure. I think that a lot of people lose that yep. in that old school experience, and they love to meet the owner of whatever business it might be and have a, have a conversation and what I get out of it is how many New Yorkers I meet who are so grateful for me yep. bringing it back, who have lived there for 40 years, yep. who knew Anthony Dopolito and what he did. And that's how I learned about also the things he did there that I brought back, um, like uh, the Grassini or the sesame s- uh, seed uh, breadsticks. Yep. Things that he did that were um, inherent to what Vesuvio is and his family did. Because right. remember, they started it. Right. And um, and they started it when that part of New York wasn't called Soho, but it was called the South Village. Yeah. And it was packed with Italian immigrants. Yeah. And uh, it just it's history. And, and I feel like so much of the city has become neutered. It's uh, I agree. Um, I mean, you know, you got those two. I remember you taking me downstairs underneath the bakery and you'd refurbish downstairs and you don't know you, you may be down the track. You'll do classes and whatever. Yeah. And those two beautiful 100 year old ovens, which you would never legally be able to get fired up never. again, because if, if you can't, you've never seen them and you're listening to me now, it's these ovens are under an apartment block and they run right through the bottom of the apartment block and they're wood fired, right? right. Like there's no, right. <laughs> I can't even imagine how anybody thought that was safe but they ran them for 100 years, right? Didn't burn the neighborhood. Well, not quite 100 years, we call it 80 years. Yep. Yeah. So so now we're getting to, um, you know, we're recording this, we're getting up to Christmas. Um, and how have you changed and pivoted your business? Because, you know, particularly I know that you've started a, a retail program for your um, press, uh, a press lounge and print restaurant. You've got a home delivery program going on. What have you done to adapt with what's going on? Because what I'm really fascinated with you is for, this is a really, really rough time for restaurants and for the world in any industry, right? But restaurants are always close to the edge. And they've kind of like, I think the statistics now is over 100,000 restaurants in the US have closed permanently. And they, I think the running total in New York is four or 5,000 in New York State, which is really sad. And I know that some people go, oh, it's a spring clean. Well, that's that's nice to say about someone's livelihood. It, I don't think it is, right? I think it's pretty bad that it happened. And so how have you managed to adapt? Because you're somebody that's seen all kinds of things happen in New York from 9-11 to Hurricane Sandy to, um, uh, you know, the GFC, the global financial meltdown. What have you had to do? Well, this is, you know, being in this business as long as I have, this is my fourth recession I've been through. Yeah, and wow. I I actually have always said I'm built for recessions. Yeah, I, yeah. I've always done better in mm-hmm. that, those times uh, because I'm not afraid, afraid of the challenge. And um, <clears throat> so this is a challenge. There's no doubt about it. I had 173 employees on March 15th, and uh, today I have 50. Yeah. And in print in the press lounge. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had many get sick. Yeah. I think half of them got sick. Wow. Some on ventilators. And I had one pass away. You know, yeah. it's it was rough. It's real. Like yeah. no, no recession. That, was even that rough? This, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, they're just the emotional, the, uh, the human toll, you yeah. know, it's taken. And then bringing people back one by one by one. You talk about, you know, the, the enjoyment I get out of, the hospitality business. I mean, it was like family members coming family back, members slowly coming back, numb, and you know, getting them, uh, having them assimilate back into the business took a couple of weeks for each one of them. Yeah, some harder. It was harder for than others, but 
but they they knew that if they sat on the sidelines, they were going to uh, at, go through atrophy. But a big part of your business is events. So right, and events now all of went a sudden, away. how did you bring everybody back? What did well, you do? What did you? How did you adapt? Well, we only brought back, only could bring back uh, forty seven because so many didn't want to come back because. Yep. They're collecting unemployment or just didn't want to come back because they felt unsafe. Uh, unsafe. Yep. And I can't fault them for any of yep. that, you know, any reason that makes them feel unsafe. Yep. Um, and uh, so I, um, I knew that the private event business was going to be compromised, and yep. it has been. Sure. Uh, so we had to change our model to going from 250 to 350 person events down to doing – 30 to 50 person socially distanced events. The press lounge, I never, ever, ever took a reservation up there. It was all free flow. We would get yep. 14 people on the flow on an, any given busy night. Now I have a capacity of 129 socially distanced. Yep. And having to eat food without, without having with, to eat to, food. to have a drink when it we was used a bar to be ninety seven percent booze right three percent which I food. still don't understand that regulation why does it have to punish a bar it's hard enough we're going to make money out of it now right we're seventy five percent booze now and twenty five percent but the labor costs associated with that obviously is crazy impacts bottom line right and so but print, I'm able to employ people I look at that as a you is know, print restaurant open so we did it's because I had print run, uh, the press lounge running. And we've been getting the small private events, and we've been getting some big ones too. We've been doing quite a few um, uh, um, commercial shoots up there. So yeah. MTV bought us out for a week to do the VMA Awards, yeah. and Netflix. Uh, last weekend we did uh, Doctor Death shot up there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Netflix bought out the hotel for a COVID bubble for 190 days to film something, yep. and we did 6,000 meals. And you're doing it, a takeout, a uh, retail takeout. So thing. Print Provisions came out of all of this, mm -hmm. uh, which was um, an e-commerce platform, which was really a protective measure because uh, room service went away in the hotel, booze went away. So we felt like a, a market that was small batch, not an Amazon, yep. consumer packaged goods, where we could also do curbside pickup. Yep. Was How's it doing? It's doing well. That's great. And we're actually starting delivery. So what's it called? Print? Print Provisions. Print Provisions. Yeah, Printprovisions.com. Okay. And how do I find that? Printprovisions.com. Just Google. Yeah. Like old school. P-R-I-N-T. And it's got its own app and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. It's, uh, so Amazing. we built a platform on Shopify. Yep. And I hired a design team who works with me, Project 13, and they did an amazing job designing that site. And yep. uh it's great. It's very awesome. cool. And uh, at the hotel, you know, we have QR codes next to the bed. So people yep. take a picture of their menu, pulls them up to print provisions, they order. So you've adapted by turning a bar into a mini restaurant, having to take reservations. We've had a terrible summer with wet weather. Now it's like getting cold and right. dark. So that's going to be another issue because now your outdoor area will be reduced to your indoor area plus right. social distancing. Well, and we have an indoor-outdoor. Uh, yeah. So we, we do have the ability to accommodate both, um, uh, you know, augmented seating, if you right. will, based on what the interior space is and what the... And, and, and Farm Shop, the ones in Mar the one in Marin and Santa Monica, are apparently killing it with doing retail really well. because they're doing a lot of home delivery, right? So Farm Shop in Santa Monica, um, we just went to 100% market. We took out the restaurant completely and it's wow. still not there. And we're doing sales-wise exactly what we did last so year. So you got rid of the restaurant turned into a to department? Full, well, we had half of it as a market. Yeah. So we went to 100% market. Wow. And then in Marin, um, we didn't have the market up there, but we created, just like we did with Print Provisions, another market for Farm Shop. We took out one of our PDRs, our private dining room, yep. and converted it into a pretty sizable market. Uh, again, small batch, artisan yep. products, and a, kind of a bottle shop as well. And um, and then, but we have great weather there. So the outdoor seating, yeah. I mean, we have nights we're doing better than we were last year. So really, you've 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 adapted as yes. best you can to limit the amount because nobody's making money, no, not real money, and and so you've adapted basically to change everything to you know at least wash your face, to get some profit in the door, and bring back your team. If I'm, Sust sustaining, sustaining, I mean, it's yeah. really about getting to the other side of the vaccine, yeah. right? And then the build back to it. So it's really just sustaining. And, you know, the PPP funding was helpful in uh, keeping fuel in the tank, but, you know, it will run out. Yeah. And uh, even if it's not, you know, some of it's granted, uh, but the amortized portion, unused portion is uh, going to run out if things don't 
come back to life sooner than later. And it's really important that Congress gets their act together sooner than later because there has to be another round. And if it's a full grant, so be it. Yeah, we've got to uh, save the restaurants. Otherwise, we're in the shit. I well, mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's pretty crazy now. Right. And people don't really understand how, what, how brutal it's been in the restaurant industry for your staff, for, you know, the emotional toll it's taken. They don't, they don't get it. You know, no. in fact, when and we're they not going to have, and winter's going to be the, uh, apocalyptic because where everybody's going inside and, and, you know, everything's spiking. Right. The people, I've got my last question to you is that you work with some of the big names of the industry, right? And you're a big name yourself and you've managed to sw- swim between the sharks. You've worked with Trotter and, and, and Thomas Keller and, you know, worked with big organizations and your career's done, you know, had, um, you know, uh, I, I think personally, I've always used a bit of a mentor. I've always rung you from across the other side of the world. I look back now and you're looking at your 20 year old self, which is kind of my last question of my show mainly everyone. And it's, everybody gives very different answers. What would you tell your 20 year old self right now? The knowledge that you have now? It's a good question. Cause part of me would say, Find another profession. <laughs> Everybody says that. Yeah, but part of me would say find another prove- profession. Um, there is There are moments of gratification in it, and it has to be in your blood because yep. every day you wake up, you need hope. You need reasons to get out of bed, get your foot on the floor, and move forward, which is, by the way, why I did reopen, to be honest, because I do believe that in, as human beings we need something to motivate us. But you're us. happy, right? I have my days. Yeah, but you're a generally happy person, right? Yes, and, and I'm, a, I'm and, an optimist. Yeah, I am accused are. of so, being so a, I, a glasses half full kind of guy. Yeah, because I, I asked Mike, a good friend of mine who runs, you know, he's the heads up Sparks Bar. And he was like, he said the same thing. I would have told my, you know, 20 year old self, don't go into restaurants. And I said, but you can't really say that to yourself because you just told me you're always really happy. And you don't know if you're in finance with a bunch of money, you would have been miserable. Correct. Right. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, we all say that in hospitality, but I wonder if we were in a different career, we'd be this content. But we, we may have more money because of the hours we work. If mm. we find ourselves in a profession. And less hair. Or, or I have less hair. Oh, you're doing all right. <laughs> like I have gray and less hair. So, but the, uh, I do, I am fit. That's yeah. all. I didn't yeah. go that direction. Yeah, yeah, I went, yeah, yeah. As I suck all my gut in. in hand, <laughs> all uh, to hell in a handbasket. But um, I, uh, uh, you know, I think that you're correct. Something different. Who knows, you know, what could have happened if yeah. I went a different path. And so I just accept the path that was, that I took. I don't question it ever. You know, that question that you ask me is asking me to question my decision. Sure. And I don't really question it. I accept it and I move forward. I'm a very loyal man. I've been a person. I've been doing the same thing for 42 years. I've been married to my beautiful wife for 34 years. I'm like, I'm all in. I go all in. Yeah. And so I I really have no regrets. No. um, Other than I wish I could spend more time with my wife. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show, mate. It was thank good you. to see you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. You're I welcome. really appreciate it. That's it for this week, peeps. If you're enjoying the show, just go to iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or whatever podcast player you listen to, and ideally give us five-star rating, if we deserve it, of course. It will help other people like you discover us. If you want to find out more on what we get up to or to suggest someone we should interview, let us know. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at The Raw Hospitality Show. The show is a Fabrica Collective production produced by Mark Fellows and Samantha Webb, music by Jindal. 